Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Monday, October 9th, 2017. Last Monday, I woke up to the tragic news from Las Vegas. And this morning, I got up to use the bathroom about 4 a.m. And the air was thick and acrid. Smelled like my neighbor was smoking some ribs. And when I looked out the window, I saw that the air was thick with smoke, uh, clouds of it forming, and there was a fine layer of ash on the bathroom floor. And wildfires broke out at 10 p.m. last night, north of me, 40 to 60 miles, near the towns of Santa Rosa and in the counties of Sonoma and Napa. I have good friends and relatives who are affected by this massive firestorm. There are more than uh, 14 distinct wildfires. It was only five uh, as recently as 9 o'clock this morning. And this fire is so intense that firefighters have not begun to try to put it out. Their first task is to rescue humans. There's only been one fatality reported so far, but I expect that number to go up. And thousands of structures, including many homes, have been completely reduced to ash and rubble. Governor Brown declared a state of emergency for Napa, Sonoma, and Yuba County. And that deploys a lot of state resources. At this point, the the numbers are clearly going to go up, but 1,500 homes and commercial buildings have been affected. My friend Bruce Cohn, manager of the Doobie Brothers, has for years owned a winery in Sonoma on Highway 12, the B.R. Cohn Winery. It was being licked by flames when I last left the television this morning. My friend Marisol Munoz Kini and many of you who follow me on Facebook see the pictures every week. She hosts a Spanish language radio show that I produce here at the Secret Studio. She and her husband Gary had just moved to a uh, a retirement community called Oakmont, just outside of Santa Rosa. And I did get a message that she is safe, she is at a shelter. And I had some encouraging news from another Oakmont resident that they were spared. But at this point, there's a lot I don't know. My cousin Grant lives in Napa. Many listeners and Facebook friends are in the area. And this is minor by comparison. But these are also the, <laughs> the areas where some of my favorite wines are produced. The Carneros region, the Sonoma Coast, the northern portions of Napa. So this is going to be devastating. There is simply no doubt about it. And it, it defies my ability to uh, really process and bring you enough information. So I encourage you to look for other outlets, the Santa Rosa Press Democrat, the San Francisco Chronicle, or any of the network television stations here in the San Francisco area. And I'll update you on my personal losses or uh, those of my, my friends and relatives as I learn about them. So you know who Bob Corker is now. He was kind of a backbench senator from Tennessee, more powerful than his public profile would suggest, chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, supported Trump in the election, was he, he saw himself as a possible candidate for Secretary of State, and I'm sure he's glad that he dodged that bullet. Bob Corker last week announced he will not seek re-election from Tennessee. And he also spoke honestly about Donald Trump after he was relieved of the political yoke of having to be a good, loyal Republican and grease the way for his own re-election. And it led to the predictable Trump Twitter shitstorm firing away against Corker. And Corker didn't hold back. <laughs> after, uh, after one exchange, he said, It's a shame the White House has become an adult daycare center. Someone obviously missed their shift this morning. And Trump apparently lied. Uh, this is at least based on Corker's accounts of their conversations over the this past year. But Trump is saying that uh, 
Corker begged him for his endorsement, but Trump wouldn't give it to him. And that Corker had asked to be Secretary of State. I said, no thanks. And Corker, in an interview, saying, I know for a fact that every single day at the White House, it's a situation of trying to contain him. And that the generals, Mattis, McMaster, and the chief of staff, General Kelly, are the thin line between (laughs) us and chaos. And this is risky for Trump, because Bob Corker has not left the Senate. And if Trump wants to undo the Iran deal, well, he blasted Corker and blamed him for the Iran deal. And if Trump wants to get uh, tax cuts passed, Corker could stand in his way because his margins are so thin. And Corker has, uh, somewhat to his credit, said that he won't vo- vote for them if uh, they're not properly paid for and that uh, you know they won't enhance the deficit. Now, his, his standards for that are pretty wobbly, but... <laughs> You know, I'll I'll give him points for intention. And regarding our zigzag president, and in particular, the way he undercut his Secretary of State, Rexon Tillerson, with tweets last week, Corker said a lot of people think that there's some kind of good cop, bad cop act underway, but that's just not true. I know he has hurt in several instances. He's hurt us as it relates to negotiations that were underway by tweeting things out. I don't know why the president tweets out things that aren't true. You know he does it. Everyone knows he does it, but he does. So this is also progress on the political scoreboard. Because Jeff Flake of Arizona was the first Republican senator to break ranks with Trump and to acknowledge that this emperor has no clothes. And now there's Corker. It takes a lot more Republicans to even contemplate an impeachment process that would lead to the Senate voting to remove Trump from office. But it appears he's alienated, too, (laughs) and that is some progress. But let's just look at the reaction. When you couple Corker's warning that Trump could be leading us into World War III with his reckless behavior, and you look at just the past week with this cryptic comment on Thursday night about the calm before the storm, and then a tweet where he said the, there's only one way to deal with North Korea? Well, Kim Jong-un has responded by pledging to build up his country's nuclear arsenal as a powerful deterrent to the U.S. And this appears to be in direct response to the tweet that only one thing will work in dealing with North Korea. And the remarks indicate that Kim has no intention of retreating under U.S. pressure, even as South Korean officials and analysts worry that the North will conduct a major weapons test to observe the anniversary tomorrow of the founding of North Korea's Workers' Party. And on the same page of my local San Francisco Chronicle today, the next story is, Top General warns U.S. against setting new sanctions. The chief of Iran's powerful Revolutionary Guard warned on Sunday The U.S. should move its military bases farther from Iran's borders and beyond the range of their missiles if they decide to impose new sanctions, which would breach the agreement that everyone agrees Iran is currently in compliance with relative to Iran's nuclear intentions. General Mohammad al-Jafari, quote, If new sanctions go into effect, the country should move its regional bases to uh, uh, 1,240-mile radius out of range of Iranian missiles. And that is a veiled warning about our military bases in Bahrain, Iraq, Oman, and Afghanistan. So Trump is actually making things worse and risking the possibility of multi-front military actions at the same time. And that is the obvious recipe for the destruction of an empire. It's happened before. Trump is oblivious. He's just so full of himself and so full of shit that he thinks somehow he is projecting strength and these people will kneel down before him. 
And as you know, he dispatched Mike Pence to Indianapolis to the Colts 49ers game and in this orchestrated scam that cost taxpayers at least a quarter million dollars. Mike Pence left the stadium because there were 23 members of the San Francisco team who took a knee during the national anthem. And Pence's tweets were (laughs) pre-written. This whole thing was all set up and ready to roll. They kept reporters in a minivan outside the stadium so they could uh, cover him as he walked out. And all this does is continue divisions and make them worse. And somehow Trump sees this as a, a moment of strength and that everyone is going to bend to his will. He's a sick, twisted moron. And as you know, Rex Tillerson blurted out the moron line last week, and apparently it was fucking moron. The uh, media cleaned it up for our consumption. And now Trump has turned on the dreamers. He is essentially repudiating whatever deal he made with Chuck and Nancy over DACA. And last night, the White House announced new terms that it knows are going to be rejected by the Democrats for any immigration package in exchange for releasing 800,000 young immigrants from their status as hostages right now in this sordid, unconscionable, cynical, and cruel process. Trump is now insisting on the construction of his wall across the southern border, hiring of 10,000 immigration agents, tougher laws for asylum, denial of federal grants to sanctuary cities, Limitations on people bringing family members to the U.S., hardening of the border against children who are fleeing violence in Central America, and looking for ways to deport them back to countries where they're likely to be killed more efficiently from the U.S. point of view. And it's clear to me that you can't negotiate with an extortionist and a liar like Trump. And I hope Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer see how badly they have been burned here and understand that this guy will not hold his word. He will not keep his word. And this, of course, just throws everything back into chaos because Trump unilaterally remove the protection for the Dreamers, effective in six months, threw this into the Congress, which has been unable to resolve it for years, and said, you sort it out, send me a bill, fix this. And we know that people will get hurt, and some people may die. There have been 38,000 children apprehended at the southern border this year, even as the adult migration across our southern border, has dropped dramatically. This is a humanitarian crisis. And Trump, you know, who loves his children so much that he gives them jobs and, you know, makes sure that they get a piece of his corrupt business enterprises, he doesn't care about anybody else's kids. And it remains to be seen what kind of leverage the Democrats will be able to use to negotiate their way out of this, but by putting the dreamers in the hostage box. They have participated in this unconscionable process where the fate of these almost all innocent people is left in the hands of this ugly political process. Last night, there were a couple of interesting stories that uh, caught my attention on the CBS News program, 60 Minutes. One was an interview with a guy we've never heard of before, Brad Parscale. He is the digital guru who spent something like $85 million of Trump campaign money on Facebook alone. And he claimed that his victory was because of the clever ways that he used Facebook. Now, I don't trust this guy. He's really tall and kind of skinny and has a scraggly beard. And there are points where I truly believed he was lying, where he could look at the camera without blinking and just say it. 
I don't believe what he said about Cambridge Analytica, that their deep dive data on American voters was not useful to his efforts. I don't believe when he denied to Leslie Stahl that uh, he used any dark ads that were aimed at dividing people, particularly on racial lines. He explicitly said that they didn't target by race, and every campaign targets by race, not necessarily in a, a nefarious way. But different voter groups are addressed in different ways. That is common in campaigns today. And also, he claimed that he didn't serve up any ads that were, you know, negative and un untrue ads about Hillary Clinton. And when we look at the efforts to manipulate the outcome of the election last year and the public polling that showed that Hillary should have won, as you know, I reject these far-fetched claims about Russian interference at this level because we had manipulators and operators right here in the United States, including right on Trump's campaign. And one of the things that uh, Parscale admitted is that he had Facebook employees embedded at his digital headquarters. And this is a big issue for Facebook. Facebook says, well, we offered it to the Clinton campaign and they declined. But to put a Facebook employee inside a political campaign to help the campaign workers decide which manipulative ad gets targeted to an explicit subset of the Facebook universe. Well, that's collusion on a campaign that I think uh, deserves deep investigation and new regulation to prevent it from happening again. And Parscale said that uh, on, on the issue of Cambridge Analytica, that their system of creating psychographic profiles of people was sinister. He, he denied that, but he said that he just didn't think it worked. And uh, an interesting piece at the Washington Post today by Philip Bump, he said, this is a simply bizarre claim in the broader context. It isn't that Parscale doesn't think that building profiles of people to target ads to them doesn't work. It's that he doesn't seem to realize that this is basically what Facebook was doing for him in real time. And when you look at the claims that have been put forward about dark ads, a dark ad is one that is aimed at somebody who you've identified, let's say just in real obvious terms, if you can determine that somebody's a member of the KKK, then you can send them an ad just with a picture of Hillary and Obama, with a headline that could be scurrilous or, or not. And Parscale claims that the campaign did run some dark ads, but none had negative or controversial messages, because if he'd done that, they would share a million times, and we'd be, it would be all over. We'd be exposed. Well, you can kind of rely on a Trump supporter. Many of them were under the radar. They knew who their friends were, and they also knew who the enemy was in political terms. And they would be very selective about who they shared that kind of information with. I do accept his point that overall it could be a deterrent. But in the case of the loyal Trump voter, I don't think that those uh, predictable behaviors necessarily apply. I'm preparing for Rachel Maddow's hyperventilation about this next story when I watch her show tonight because Google has found evidence that Russian agents, that's the language here in the New York Times, bought ads on its wide-ranging networks in an effort to interfere with the 2016 election. Using accounts believed to be connected to the Russian government, the agents pur purchased $4,700 worth of search ads and some more traditional display ads. Now, first of all, this is a dubious claim. Accounts believed to be connected to the Russian government. There is no evidence to support that. This is an assertion. Then it becomes laughable when you talk about $4,700 worth of search ads on Google. I mean, that is not uh, any anything that is meaningful in terms of interfering with our election. 
And then they found a, a separate uh, stack of $53,000 worth of ads with political material that were purchased from Russian Internet addresses, building addresses, or with rubles. But it is not clear whether any of these were state-sponsored ads and may have been legitimate ad spending by Russian citizens. There are 150 million of them. But in our media, when the term Russian is used, everybody thinks of Putin and figures that all 150 million just follow whatever he tells them to do. And in the Vice News coverage of the Google ad, well, they fudge this by saying the Russians spent tens of thousands of dollars on ads. As I just pointed out, the more clear coverage in the New York Times says 4,700 that they believe came from Russian agents. But to use this term tens of thousands is really irresponsible. Then they recap on the Facebook uh, issue and say the Google ads do not appear to have been bought by the same agency, the Internet Research Agency, that is claimed to be associated with the Russian government. So we get more sloppy reporting and speculation, and that's why this new report from CNN stands out. It is based on a named source, an American lawyer for the <clears throat> Russian lawyer, whose name is Natalia Veselnitskaya. And as you know, I have, uh, have uh, stated that the only hard public evidence we have of attempts by the Trump campaign to collude with Russians are in Don Jr.'s emails related to this meeting at Trump Tower in June of 2016. And his Russian buddy told him, you know, in order to get him to take the meeting, that he was going to get dirt on Hillary, and he said, I love it. Now, that shows a bad intention on the part of, of Don Trump Jr. But according to CNN, documents provided by the lawyer to Veselnitskaya, who is an American named uh, Balber, Paul Balber, I think it is. Uh, Scott Balber, pardon me. He represents uh, two of the Russians who were uh, connected to this meeting. He went to Moscow to obtain the documents from Veselnitskaya. Now, we cannot uh, certify that these are legitimate documents. Somebody could have gone on their word processor and written them up a week before Barber collected them. But it does diminish the claims of the purpose of the meeting. It shows they wanted to talk about the Magnitsky Act. And it does appear that American legislators of both parties were snookered by this American billionaire who claimed that uh, Magnitsky was his accountant and that he was snuffed out by the Russians after exposing fraud. And again, I cannot verify either side of that story. All I can tell you is there are serious doubts about whether the uh, story that drove the passage of the Magnitsky Act, which put sanctions on uh, certain people in Russia, was legitimate. So that is that. And one more Trump story. I can't uh, leave this one out. Because as recently as last week, when we talked about the media malpractice that led to Trump's election, I noted that the uh, so-called equal time rule that requires television stations licensed by the FCC to offer equal time to competing candidates. So in the Republican primary, when they gave Trump 20 minutes, they should have given 20 to Jeb Bush and 20 to Marco Rubio and 20 to uh, John Kasich. But they didn't. And now, because Trump is offended and his ego is bruised by the jokes on late night TV, he sent out a tweet on Saturday. It probably was about the time Saturday Night Live was on. And I don't think they hit Trump this week. No, I, I, I saw the show and I don't recall anything that even mentioned him. Maybe in Weekend Update. I don't know. Anyway, he says late night hosts are dealing with the Democrats for their very unfunny and repetitive material, always anti-Trump. Should we get equal time? And Mike DiCenzo, a producer for Jimmy Fallon show at NBC, gets it right. He said, that's not how it works. You're not campaigning. The equal time law only applies to campaigns, and nobody observes it anyway. And the biggest beneficiary of the failure to enforce the equal time rule is a fathead named Donald Trump. 
Every day I pause for a second to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins Podcast with your subscriptions. And I want to thank Alice Carlson, Michael Kadish, Kadish, George Reeves, and everyone else who supports my work, either with annual subscriptions or monthly subscriptions. And if you're not one of those people, can I invite you to join them? I need more support to keep all this going. I've lost some subscribers because of my strong opinions and my failure to kowtow to the consensus view, particularly on Trump Russia. And if you value my outspoken independent views, then put your money where your ears are, please. <laughs> Come on over to PeterBCollins.com, click on the menu button, pull it down, click on Become a Subscriber, takes you to the sign-up page. And Nancy Kilgore, she navigated some problems with uh, uh, PayPal to renew her annual subscription. Nancy, thank you very much. And while I'm doing some kind of name-dropping here, I want to mention that John Kiriakou, the American who was sent to federal prison, a former CIA officer who admitted that his agency broke the law and tortured people. John Kiriakou had a serious motorcycle accident last week in Washington, D.C., and he is hospitalized with a couple of uh, cracked ribs and a broken vertebrae. And if you have a chance to reach out to him, he's on Facebook. A lot of people talk to him there. I hope you will. The other story I watched with interest on 60 Minutes last night was the hero worship of the first responders last week in Las Vegas. And I want to separate out here two comments. One is, there are a lot of touching stories of people who were at the concert, law enforcement people who were either working overtime as security for the concert or who came when they heard the reports of shots fired. There are many heroes in Las Vegas. And I don't want to take anything away from the personal courage that many people displayed. But last night on 60 Minutes, they brought us uh, five or six cops who did show real courage and, and a commitment to their mission in the chaotic events in Las Vegas last Sunday night. But the report was so busy trying to lock in the official story, trying to worship these individuals at the expense of many others who deserve credit? They didn't ask a single tough question. For example, they replayed the scenario where these cops had to climb 32 floors at the Mandalay Bay. They had to break through a fire door that they say the shooter had uh, 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 secured shut with a metal bar. And then they tell us how they went to his room and they blew open the door. Only there was a 72-minute gap between the time the shooting stopped and the door to the hotel room on the 32nd floor was blown down. Not a single reference to that. No questions were asked. You, you, you know, I listened carefully to the narrative that was offered. There was also, of course, no discussion of the potential for a second shooter. Even the Clark County Sheriff Lombardo raised the question himself. Do you think this was all accomplished on his own? Face value, you've got to make the assumption that he had to have some help at some point, and we want to ensure that that's the answer. But not on 60 Minutes. Nothing that would challenge the questionable narrative that has been presented to the American public was permitted on that broadcast. All right, I got news on Feinstein and Weinstein. The U.S. Senate's oldest member, California's Dianne Feinstein, aged 84, is defying the polls and my personal preferences and her advancing age. And today she ended speculation and said she will run for re-election next year. She's been hogging the middle of the road since 92. She ought to get out of the way. And I hope that voters will send her that message. I hope that there is a courageous Democrat who will challenge her in the primary here next year. But I kind of doubt it. Feinstein is tough to beat, and uh, I helped a Republican candidate run against her when she was up for re-election in 2000. My friend, the moderate, uh, moderate Republican, Tom Campbell, challenged her, and he really didn't make a dent. The Republicans didn't back him because he opposed Bush's tax cuts before Bush was even president. 
And so it goes. And Weinstein, Harvey got fired by the remaining members of his board of directors last night. Five of them have resigned since Friday in protest of his now exposed actions as a sexual harasser and predator. And this, of course, is a big target because Harvey was a big liberal, supported all the Democrats, gave him lots of money, made movies that advanced some Democratic themes. And it's uh, something that we're going to have to deal with over the next few months. My friend Jason Leopold, who joined BuzzFeed at the beginning of this year, has a piece out that he co-wrote with uh, Ariana Lang called Inside the FBI's Half-Secret Relationship with Hollywood. And the article, which is not based on anonymous leaks, it is based on documents obtained after a three-year campaign, including lawsuits, under the Freedom of Information Act. This is what Leopold does best. And, for example, the new movie, Mark Felt, The Man Who Brought Down the White House, that's the Deep Throat movie. It's showing at the Mill Valley Film Festival right now, and it'll be out in the theater soon. Well, it was produced with just a little bit of help from the FBI. So was the uh, Miley Cyrus uh, vehicle that went straight to DVD, and I missed it altogether, called So Undercover. The series Fatal Encounters. And what it shows here at the FBI for 80 years has been managing its image by muscling the media. And this trend continues today. A few years ago, an FBI agent was reading a Hollywood trade publication when they learned about a movie that would star Sylvester Stallone as a reputed mob enforcer and an FBI informant named Gregory Scarpa. They got sh- they made sure that uh, that film represented the FBI the way they wanted. And they denied a, a film, uh, the use of the FBI logo, in a film that was released in 2012 starring The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, called Empire State. They put in a request to use the FBI seal in the film. But the FBI declined, saying that the script doesn't accurately portray FBI procedures and personnel. So they exercised this power, and the movie producers often will make a trade-off in order to get the realism and access to use, say, the FBI building in Washington, D.C. They let the FBI control the content of their film. And Leopold singles out for special mention the film Selma, made in 2014, which portrays the Bureau's intense surveillance of Martin Luther King, that's one of the recent films that explicitly did not reach out to the FBI or allow them to review the screenplay before it was produced. Yesterday in Barcelona, we're told that somewhere between 350,000 and 900,000 people took to the streets to oppose the independence move that was voted on a week ago. Now, this creates a huge conundrum. Will the Catalan leaders move forward this week with their declaration of independence as they promised? Or will this set them back? Because clearly Madrid pulled out all the stops, got all of the union members that they uh, have sway over to hit the streets, and they used the Spanish flag, the red and yellow flag, that has been basically uh, not allowed in Catalonia for decades. The march was peaceful. No major incidents reported. We shall see where it all goes. A couple of quickies before I go here. Scott Pruitt, who sued the EPA dozens of times, well, maybe it wasn't dozens, but many times while he was the, uh, uh, what was he, Secretary of State, in uh, in Oklahoma. Sorry, he was the attorney general there. Anyway, he went to Hazard, Kentucky today. And I want to tip you off that uh, go to your favorite music uh, online source, Apple Music, Spotify, whatever you use, iTunes, and just enter in the search window the L&N Don't Stop Here Anymore. 
That's a town about Hazard, Kentucky, a coal mining town. And when I grew up in Cincinnati, I worked in a factory with a bunch of guys who had escaped the coal mines of Hazard, Kentucky. And those coal mines were in decline in the 1960s. But that didn't stop, stop Scott Pruitt from going to Hazard County, Kentucky today and proclaiming that the war on coal is over, clean coal will be coming out of the mountains, and jobs will be returning. Everything's going to be hunky-dory. And even Mitch McConnell, who was there to soak up the, uh, <laughs> the credit, admitted this doesn't immediately bring everything back, but it stops the further decline of coal-fired power plants in the United States. And you can expect tons of lawsuits to challenge that for years to come. Thanks for joining me today for my daily news and comment podcast. I wish the best to the people who are fighting the fire here in Northern California. And I like to remind you this podcast is free and available on YouTube. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails.